Welcome to lecture 15 of advanced robotics. Um, we're going to cover POMDP's partially observable markup decision processes today. We actually still had a little bit to cover from lecture 13. We saw maximum likelihood, but we didn't yet cover expectation maximization. So I'm going to switch out of this and switch to the lecture 13, last section of lecture expectation maximization. So what did we cover in lecture 13 um, that directly ties into this? We covered maximum likelihood. And the idea was that you try to find the parameters of your probability distribution such that under those parameters, the data you collected is maximally likely. And so then those parameters might make for the best explanation of your data. And that's the parameters we're going to choose. We then looked at maximum a posteriori because maybe you don't have infinite data, and so maybe you have some prior knowledge that maybe you know it's never a zero probability for some outcome, so you might want to bound it away from that or steer it away from that. So you can put in prior information, often in the form of fake data, as if you dreamt up some data, added it, and then do maximum likelihood objective multiplied with the um, prior to get the a posteriori parameters. Um, then. The thing we didn't cover yet is expectation maximization. And it's actually pretty important. So imagine we're trying to um, fit a mixture of two Gaussians. So what we have here is um, equal probability of coming from one Gaussian or the other Gaussian. They have different means. Same, uh, they could have the same or different covariance. And what we then see if we look at the maximum likely objective, oh, by the way, I got this now too. If we look at the, uh, <laughs> if we look at, let's see, if we look at the maximum likelihood objective, um, we have maximization over the parameters theta, which is probability of mode one versus mode two, mu, which is the means of each Gaussian, sigma the covariances of each Gaussian. We want the log probability of the data, but it's under the mixture distribution, which is a sum of two distributions, and so. What we have is the log of a sum of things. Um, usually when we have maximum likelihood, we have the log of a product of things. And then it naturally becomes a sum of logs. And the math becomes very easy. Here, if we just take derivatives, set them equal to 0, then we actually won't be able to find a closed form solution for the parameters uh, theta, mu, and sigma. So you could say, well, we can just run gradient descent. That's one way to go. But what people have found more effective is something called expectation maximization. It's still running an optimization, but it's running the optimization in a very specific way. So let's look at that. So here's our um, x is the underlying discrete variable. Could take on the value 1 or 2, equal probability. z is the continuous variable and comes from a Gaussian. And the Gaussian it comes from depends on whether x was equal to 1 or equal to 2. It will be, come from a different mean. We're given some data, just disease, but no x's. So we don't know which Gaussian it came from. We just know that it came from one of those two Gaussians. And we have data point c. Can we find a maximum likelihood estimates for mu1 and mu2? Let's assume we know the prior is fixed over x1 and x being 1 or 2. It's 1 half, 1 half. We just want to find the two mu's. OK. The basic idea for EM, and this is really the thing that um, and the high level is a key thing to retain. Basic idea, if xi were known for each data sample, not just the zi, but also the xi, it's a very easy problem. Because then you can just split it. These are the xi's where it's 1. This is where it's 2. And when it's 1, you estimate the mean of the z's that belong to that group of data. And the other group of data will be for the mean for mu2. In EM, um, the setting that you're given is that the underlying latent variable is not given to you. So what can you do? You can decide to alternate. An E step uh, or expectation step will try to fill in the missing data. So you might say, OK, well, I only have the z's, but I'm going to guess the axis. And then once I've guessed the axis, now I have x and z. And now I can easily do a closed form solution to find the mean for each of the two Gaussians. <coughs> now, when I describe it this way, it sounds pretty heuristic. You just kind of fill in the data. Um, maybe based on some posterior or something, and then estimate um, the parameters based on that, and you repeat. We I mean, I should derive that is the, a proper way of optimizing the objective. 
And this is what we're going to look at is the EM derivation, which is um, going to use Jensen's inequality, which is the most widely used inequality in um, pretty much anything machine learning AI, it seems. So let's step through that and formally derive that alternating between trying to fill in the data and then maximizing with the filled in data and repeat is actually the correct thing to do. So we'll have a maximization over theta, which is all our parameters of our distribution. So still maximum likelihood. We'll look at the log. And in principle, there would be a summation here, but I'm just going to have one term. In principle, there's multiple data points. You have a sum of these. But um, we'll just have one data point. So log, and then x is unobserved, so the integrate over it or sum over it. And then we have a joint distribution between x and z, which has parameters theta and integrate out over x. Because all we get to observe is z. And so we're trying to maximize the likelihood of z. And this thing here is the marginal probability for z. So trying to maximize the log probability of z's. So x not observed, z observed. If you want to go to the more canonical setting, we have a lot of data. Then all that would happen is you have a summation here over i, and you'd have a zi over here. That's the only difference. Um, but then we'll just do the math that we're doing now multiple times for each term in the summation. So we're just going to focus on one term, and then we don't have to index into i everywhere. OK, now, now we're going to play a trick that is kind of, well, I wouldn't say it's obvious at all until you've seen it many times. And then you're like, oh, that's always a trick you play. Um, let's say this is equal to max over theta log integral over x q of x divided by q of x. And we don't, haven't even defined q of x. It's just some distribution. Um, P x comma z theta dx. So that's the same thing because we just multiplied and divided by the what then together becomes just a factor of one. Now what we're going to use is Jensen's inequality to try to simplify this. What is Jensen's inequality? Pictorially, what it is, it says that if you have some function, and here we have, let's say, a concave function um, that we're maximizing. You have a function like this, where for any two points, let's call this x-axis, for any two points, x1 and x2, the line lies below the function that we can say, well, let's do this by example first. Let's say we have x1, x2. This is our function f of x. If we think about a distribution over the values x can take on, so some probability x equal x1, some other probability x equal x2, and let's say that sums to 1. And maybe let's call this one 1 minus lambda and this one lambda. Then we can say, what is the expected value? Well, what is the function value at the expected value of x? And we're going to wonder how that relates to the Expected value, so expectation is, is over x. Expected value over x of f of x. So we're wondering, 
if we can swap the expectation and the f. If, we can, if, the, if this were equal, then we could just swap them. And then when we're looking at things here, maybe, I mean, log, probability, maybe we could make things simpler. Um, so how do they relate to each other? Let's look at a simple example. So here, expected value for x would be, then we'd have f of, um, let's say lambda is 1 half. To keep it simple, so let's say lambda equals 1 half. Going by example, f of 1 half x1 plus 1 half x2. Show you this thing over here, 1 half x1 plus 1 half x2. Bring this up, f of that thing. Right here. Then this side is the expected value of f of x. So this is really then 1 half f of x1 plus 1 half f of x2, which is this point over here. So what do we see? The function value of the expected value of x is bigger than the expected function value. Now, I did this with 1 half, but you can Imagine that if I picked any lambda between 0 and 1, the same thing would be true, because it's really about the fact that this line lies below the function. And that's what makes the sign go this way. And imagine I took um, multiple x's that could take on, uh, that x, multiple values x could take on. Maybe there could be an x3 also. Then the same thing will happen. We'll just have some kind of average of x1, x2, x3. After we take the average, we project onto the, the line above, whereas if we actually look at the, um, sorry, we take an average of x1, x2, x3, just like we did here for x1 and x2, and we go to the function, and we'll see that the function is above. And the same thing if we average x1, x2, x3, maybe depending on the weighting, we end up over here. We go up, and again, we see the function is above the line, which means the function of the expected value is bigger than the expected value of the function. So Jensen's inequality says this in generality. So this was an example. But it says this in generality that the function applied to the expected value of x is bigger than or equal to the expected value of function of x, assuming the function looks like that. Obviously, if the function were curved the other way, the inequality would go the other way. It's because the function is curved uh, like, a, like a hill, effectively, that you get this inequality. So this is, James McCall says, if f concave, then f of the expected value of x is bigger than expected value of f of x. And equality only if f is affine, meaning f is a line or a hyperplane. Because if f is actually a line, well, if f were a line, then the line connecting the points will be the same as the line that is f, and you'll have equality. But if it's not a fine, then you'll always have a difference between the two. OK, so now that we know this, um, let's take a look. What do we have here? We have an expected value. So let's write explicitly that. We have max over theta. Then we have the log, which is going to be our f, by the way. Um, then we have the expected value with x coming from q of x of p x comma z theta over q of x. Now, chances inequality says that we can if the function f is concave, we can flip the order of log and expectation. Well, log is concave, so we can flip the order of log and expectation. So we can say this is log is f. f of the expected value is bigger than expected value of f. So we can say bigger than or equal to the max over theta expected value x according to q of x of and then log p x comma z theta 
over q of x. You might say it's a lot of math, and you now have a q, and you have a lot of other things introduced that maybe don't simplify, but you'll soon see that actually now we have something simpler to work with, even though there is more um, symbols involved here than there were over there. It's actually a simpler thing to work with. So what does this mean? A um, couple of things. We want to check. Uh, we're trying to maximize over theta. And we now found another function that is actually smaller than our original function. And so you have some function we're trying to maximize. And we found another function that's smaller. We know that it's equal whenever f is affine. So whenever this, is, this thing over here is affine. Well, a very special case of affine as the one that's, that tends to be used is this is going to be with equality if this is a constant. Because if this, this thing is a constant, then it's a special kind of line that just runs horizontal. So if this is a constant, we have equality. So if we make q of x proportional to p x comma z theta, we have equality. But q of x is a distribution. So how do we make a distribution over x proportional to something like that as x and z in it? Well, the only way that's going to happen is if q of x is equal to the conditional of x given z under the current parameters theta. So equality if q of x is equal to conditional x given z. Now, here is our algorithm then. I said we're going to fill in the blanks when we don't know the hidden variable x. We're going to fill it in by inferring it. That's exactly what's happening here. We're saying we're going to find the conditional of x given z. That is what we call q of x. And once we have found q of x, well, once we found q of x, look at this objective. Um, what's left in, in the objective, the bottom part here doesn't matter because q is now fixed. But we're left with expected value under q of x of the log probability of x comma z. And so this thing here is like saying, I'm going to imagine x were discrete for a moment. I'm going to fill in, based on that distribution here, x given z, some pseudo counts. Let's say I have a put equal probability on x equal 1 and 2. Then this would say, half the time I want to look at the log probability under x equal 1. Half the time I want to look at the log probability of z under x equal 2. And so this thing here will be the thing we then optimize and will actually be in closed form. It'll look, well, for simple distributions, it'll be in closed form because it looks just like having an expectation where we have actually now filled in the axis. This is filling in the axis, and this is just log likelihood. And now we have observed x because we filled in from q of x, and z was always observed because z is the variable that we saw from the beginning. So we'll see some examples for that. Pictorially, what happens is this is our original objective. So call it the likelihood of our data under parameter, parameter vector theta. Then this objective over here is a lower bound. So maybe right now we're here. Um, this horizontal axis would be where theta lives. Maybe we're here right now. Um, this, this is our theta, theta from our current iteration, maybe iteration 1. Then we'd say, well, instead of looking at the original function, we're finding a lower bound, which is equal by choosing the correct q of x, equal here. And in fact, you can even show that the gradients are the same. It'll actually be tangential. And it'll go below. So strictly below. So it might look something like this. So finding x given z is really finding this new objective function that we can then use here to optimize theta often easily jump to this point over here. Then once we're here, actually we're close to the optimum, we'll have a new bound coming here. And from there, it'll probably jump over here, and we'll find this local optimum. It's not guaranteed to be globally optimal, but it will locally optimize. And it'll do it in a somewhat second order way. It's not just a gradient step. It understands much more about the optimization objective than a gradient would do. All right, so. 
Let's take a look at what the full algorithm looks like then. So what we have is at the top what I derived on the board, which is mags log, maximize the log probability of the data, which is z, where x is a hidden variable we need to integrate out over. We then apply chances inequality, which is the full top line. We know it holds with equality when that thing is affine, which in practice we can achieve by just making it constant. And so we set q of x equal to the condition of x given z under the current parameter vector theta. Then from there, um, we iterate. So once we found q of x, we can go to the m step, which is just optimizing this thing over here. Again, this thing is fairly simple because it's an integral over x for q of x, but this is essentially like pseudo counts. It's like filling in your data. That's what q of x is doing. And then for fully observed data, you have seen both the x and the z for each one of them now. You can now look at the log probability jointly of x and z, maximize data for that, and repeat. So let's look at some examples. Here's this in action. So um, horizontal axis is mu, a single parameter, because I mean to make graphs, it's nice to have only one parameter. And I ran this on a uh, mixture of Gaussians data set where you have essentially uh, two Gaussians. One has a mean of negative mu, the other one a mean of positive mu, but we don't know mu. And then you can here see what the objective uh, looks like. Um, and so we see two peaks naturally because negative mu and positive mu are kind of swappable in, in the description I gave. And so we see that it actually uh, finds this bound. If you plot it out carefully, it'll go to the peak of that bound and it'll repeat as you run EM. Here is two iterations in action. So we have um, an assumption that there's only one parameter mu, which results in mu1 and mu2 being these values. And we have mu in the horizontal axis. That's our theta here. And we try to um, maximize the objective, the likelihood. And the red curves are the lower bounds. And so we locally have a lower bound. The first one happens um, over here. We have lower bound. Um, this is then the, the red one's lower bound. The optimum is here. From there, we end up at this point, have the new lower bound. And at this point, we're getting very close to the optimum. OK, so if you look at the math for EM for mixture of Gaussians, um, you observe the Z's, but not the X's. Um, what's the probability of X being essentially the identification of the Gaussian you're coming from? Well, it's shown over there. You can, you can uh, find um, the probability for each uh, value you could take on. And then once you have that, you've filled in your x's effectively, but with fractional values. You don't fill them in like with the most likely, but fractional. And then from there, you um, have the objective that's easy to optimize. The thetas here correspond to um, the, um, well, x is the same. The theta is a mixture of probabilities. So working this all out, x taking on a specific value of k is proportional to theta k, which is the prior for x, and the density of that of that Gaussian um, at the data point. That's not normalized, but you can normalize this across all values x can take on. That gives you the counts. Once you have those counts filled in over here, um, you get a standard Gaussian objective that decouples for each of the mu's. Each of the Gaussians has its own mu and possibly sigma, and has its own set of terms uh, coming from this very simple maximum likelihood for a Gaussian. You can do the same thing for HMMs. Um, not going to do the, all the details here, but remember HMM, you have a dynamics model and an observation model. Often, you don't observe the underlying state. You only observe the sensory measurements. So the question is, can you recover the dynamics model and the sensory observation model from just having a sequence of sensory measurements? That's, again, a maximum likelihood problem that we, I mean, you can set it up that way, um, but it'll have hidden variables. And so if you look at applying, you apply chances inequality here, look at what happens, um, get the same thing, and always the same thing. You get that you need to compute the conditional of um, 
x, which is hidden, given the observations, which you actually get from the smoother. Smoother gives you the condition of x given the observations. And then you can, come, you can use that x and the sensor observation z together to do maximum likelihood on the conditional of sensory observation given state. Then for the dynamics model, you actually need to run the smoother to extract the joint distribution over xt and xt plus 1 for all t. You need to joint distribution between two time slices to be able to fit to that the conditional of the next time slice given the previous one. And so I remember when we talked about the smoother and I said, oh, you can actually also run it to get out the joint between two time steps and it'll be useful at some point. This is where it's useful. It's to be able to recover the dynamics model that is associated with the uh, dynamics of the state of this process. So um, what you would do is you would run um, smoother to find both the joint between xt and xt plus 1 and the marginal for xt, which you'll use with the observation zt. Um, one quick observation here is in the kind of general derivation of um, EM, it'll say find the conditional of all unobserved variables given the observed variables and plug that in. That's actually very hard to represent directly because it's many, many unobserved variables and the joint will be a very unwieldy thing. But often, when you look at the details, that's what happened here. If you look at the details, let's assume we have access to the full joint. Work through the details, we'll see that actually the only way the full joint is used is by using the marginal over x at each time slice t and by using the joint over two time slices. So you don't need the actual full joint. It's enough to find the marginal and the uh, pairwise uh, marginal for neighboring time steps. <coughs> You can do this for Gaussians. Let's say you have a linear Gaussian system, much like a common filter setup. Um, you're given the control inputs. You're given the observations, not given the states. You might not even have a dynamics model. You might not even have A, B, C, D. You might not even have Q and R, but you have a sequence of sensory observations. Can you back it all out? Well, that's an HMM again. What do you do? You run a forward pass, a backward pass. We actually didn't put the backward pass equations on the slides when we covered the, the smoother initially. We said you should be able to derive this. But if you're curious, this is actually the result. Um, forward pass, backward pass. From that, you get the relevant um, quantities, which is the distributions for x marginally at each time and x and xt and xt plus 1, which are the things we need to then be able to derive um, the maximum likelihood estimates of Q and R. Um, and then, of course, after we found Q and R, let's say we only need to find Q and R, the covariance matrices, we rerun the filter and the smoother, get new marginals, re-estimate Q and R, repeat, repeat, repeat. I'm not showing the equations for how to estimate A, B, C, and D. For A, B, C, and D, you actually need to um, find the joint. For A, you need to find the joint between T and T plus 1. And then um, you'll have something like a least squares problem, but it's a little more complicated because you, in a normal least squares, you have full certainty on one variable and just that uncertainty, you're supposed to break the other one. But here we'll have a joint over xt and xt plus 1. Both have uncertainty. So it'll look a lot like least squares if you work through what you, how you uh, determine A, but it won't be exactly the same as least squares. You still have to account for the uncertainty on xt. Now, one thing to do when you run this is to keep track of the likelihood. So we're optimizing this objective called likelihood. And so every update, it should improve. If it does not, it's likely there's a bug or maybe numerical problems or something. So what does the likelihood look like? Likelihood is log joint probability over all the sensory observations because we don't see the underlying <laughs> states x. So there's no uh, likelihood over that. It's integrated out. So what is that really? It's probability for z0 and then the conditionals of zt given all the past ones. Um, you can, these are the equations for finding this. So the next observation, um, mean and variance for z are given by these simple um, updates here. And once you have those, then you can fill it into the Gaussian density, take the log and get um, get the sum of the log probabilities. It's a really good way to make sure you don't have any bugs. If this thing is not consistently going up, it means something is wrong in your implementation. 
becomes even more important if you, let's say, were to run an extended Kalman filter. Because when you run an extended Kalman filter, the assumptions I just talked about are actually broken. Because you'll do a second order update as you run EM. But you do it based on having linearized your dynamics along a path. And how did you linearize this by, well, essentially linearizing along your estimated states. And those will be a guess. And since you have a guess there, and then that guess might be wrong, the bound I talked about might actually not hold true. So because that bound is assuming that you actually have a linear system. You run smooth, filter smoother on the linear system. EM bound tells you, OK, now if I make a step, it'll be better. But it'll only be better on the linear system. So we'll have to do after you, um, in an extended common filter setting, try to find the parameters of the system. After you found that update, you'll have to do a line search. Say, did I really improve on the original objective or not? How do you do that line search? Well, that's by looking at evaluating the actual objective that you care about, checking that you're not overstepping effectively. OK, that's it for expectation maximization. Let's maybe pause here for some questions about that. So it seems like you're you're, uh, you're converting your problem into some kind of concave mm -hmm. problem that lower bounds your thing. Uh, I'm sort of confused or lack intuition for why when you jump to the maximum of that <coughs> concave lower bound, you can't uh, overshoot and kind of keep jumping back and forth between the peaks. Like if you look at the the curves you drew, right? Mm -hmm. It seems like you could jump to the uh, the peak of your concave lower bound and overshoot? Yeah, so it's a good question. So well, maybe let's draw it out. So imagine there's two peaks, because that's really the question, right? If there's two peaks, might you not converge because you jump back and forth? Um, So let's look at this scenario with two peaks. And I'll just draw it by example. And so the concern, the potential concern of why you might not converge is imagine you're currently here, let's say. And your next step maybe lands you over here. Um, and then maybe it'll jump back and forth between the two. And so, yeah. So because because it's guaranteed to be a lower bound, this thing prevents that from happening. Um, so that since it's actually it's a global lower bound, maybe that's key. It's it's not just a local. It's not just that it's locally right where you are a lower bound. It's a global lower bound on the objective, and so that's why it wouldn't be able to do that. Because once you have a global lower bound, the only way to get there, we need to have some pretty crazy running thing that somehow peaks over here, which is possible. But at some point, you'll exceed this level. And once you've exceeded that level, you, you won't have any way back to the other side. Any other questions? OK, then let's take our break now. And then in a couple minutes, let's start the uh, part on PalmDPs.
Mm-hmm. How do you get the um, probability of the latent variable given the observed variables again? Do you have to use a smoother or um, so you for uh, HMM like, like setting? Yes, yeah, you would use a smoother. About, for something like counts, like if you're like flipping a a coin or something. So you can. So there's a common smoother, but actually it's also called a smoother when you just have a discrete HMM. Mm -hmm. So the forward pass would be a filtering pass, and the backward pass would be the smoother pass. And you'd still want to do both a forward and a backward pass to okay. get the conditional distributions given all observations. Okay. So every step you're updating your, you're just updating data, or are you? So first data? you find the hidden variables. Once you've done that. Effectively, you've filled in your data set and you have everything is observed. At that point, the maximum likelihood objective tends to become easy to evaluate mm -hmm. if, and, and, op, and find the optimum, but it's just a bound. It's not the one you really want. If you optimize that, usually in closed form, find a new setting of the parameters of the distribution, so a dynamics model and observation model. And then when you run the filter and smoother again, you'll have a different result okay. because the parameters have changed. Okay. And so then you'll repeat this process. Mm -hmm. Can you provide some more intuition here? So for the EM, so we instead of optimizing over this, we instead maximizing over this. But I see that these terms are the same. So the PX, uh, the joint X, they appears again here. So why we can simplify things to this side? The reason it works is if you have the right choice of Q. Okay. The right choice of Q optimizing this thing. Mm -hmm. It's going to do the same thing as optimizing this thing over here. Okay. And so, if you have this Q, okay. then this objective here will be a well. Will be a cool will be the, will be the right shape. objective to okay. optimize to find better parameters. But after you've done it, you'll have to go back and find a new Q because after you've optimized your parameters mm -hmm. in your M step, yeah. um, if you were to now rederive what Q of X should be you'll see it's different because Q of X is the condition of X given Z yeah. under the parameter vector theta, yeah. but you just change theta, theta. so you've got to go change your Q and repeat. Okay, okay yeah, thanks. Sure. <clears throat> All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, let's take a look at palm DPs. So here's the outline for today. Um, we're going to do a quick introduction to what palm DPs are. We'll see. You can solve them exactly, but that's usually impractical because too expensive computationally. Um, and then we'll look at locally optimal solutions for palm DPs. And I think at the end we might look at the separation principle, or it might be for for next time. All right. So. We'll still have a Markov decision process. That will not have changed. So we're all familiar with this. And the goal will still be to optimize expected reward. But the difference is going to be that we don't get to observe the state. When you look at the diagram over there, the environment outputs state for the agent to observe is not going to be available anymore. It's still going to exist. There will be a state. We assume there is some system underneath. We just don't get to observe it directly. So we'll have the world. Um, agent takes an action into the world. Out comes reward still. But then observation O, which is not necessarily directly the state. Mm -hmm. Now, you can think of MDPs as special palm DPs, because MDP is a palm DP where the observation equals the state. Well, we've seen a lot now about how to deal with the fact that we only get observations, not the real state. We've seen probabilistic reasoning to get out you know, most likely state estimates and means and covariance and all related things. So um, how can we now essentially solve problems where this is actually a thing? Because in MDPs, that's not a thing. But in POMDPs, we really need to worry about what the underlying state might be. Um, and the outcome here will really be that, in some sense, we're going to have to do two things. You can imagine, OK. One thing you have to do is run a filter at all times. The filter will keep track for you of the distribution over possible states. And that's the best you can know about the world if all you have is a palm DP. And the best you can do is get the distribution over possible states at the current time. Then your policy will not take in a state and output an action. It will take in a distribution over possible states. 
and output an action based on that distribution. And now, here's a kind of canonical PalmDP example from uh, Leslie Cabling's early papers on PalmDPs. You are in a room. It's kind of a, a bad situation, but you're in a room, and there's only two doors. And you kind of want to exit um, that room. Um, but uh, behind one of the doors, there's a tiger. And a tiger likes to eat you. Um, so if you take the wrong door, it's very bad for you. Penalty for wrong opening here is minus 100. I mean, it's a very benign penalty for getting eaten. <laughs> Probably most of you would give a more negative reward for that. Um, the reward for correct opening is plus 10. Um, so the correct door um, gives you plus 10. That's nice. Um, but now the interesting thing is that you don't have to just choose. You can actually also listen. And maybe the tiger is growling. And then the tiger growls, you might be able to locate which door the tiger was behind. And so there's a model here where it says that if the tiger is behind, when you listen, you just decide to listen, you hear a growl, um, you essentially have 85% correctness in your sensory model of determining whether it came from the left or the right. Um, so if you listen many, many times, then over time, as you run your filter, you might accumulate enough certainty that your probability of the tiger behind one door versus the other becomes very peaked. At that point, you might be able to take the risk and say, I'm taking the door where I don't think the tiger is. There's no guarantees. It might still be there. Um, but um, if you say it's minus 100, maybe it's just a robot. It's not you. And so you can say for the robot, it's minus 100 to exit on the tiger side and plus 10 to exit the other side. And then you can imagine that once you're 90% sure, about 90% or more sure about which side the tiger is at, then it's actually better not to listen anymore because you pay for listening. It's better to take your chances. And on expectation, you'll have, if you're 90% sure, you'll have a reward of 0 at 90% on, expect on expectation. And so if you're more than 90% sure, you'll have a reward on expectation higher than 0, which is better than negative 1 for listening. OK, so um, what we really have all of a sudden now is something called a belief state. So in some sense, we can say a PomDP is just an MDP. It's just a, oh, these slides are not fully updated. Oh, well. Um, a PomDP is just a MDP where you, instead of having a state that's a state in the world, it's your probability distribution is the state. And you think about, OK, um, let's say I only have um, one time step. And maybe I listened, and I started with a 50-50. And then if I hear something on the left, then my distribution shifts. If I hear something on the right, my distribution shifts the other way. And so. <clears throat> What we see here is that we can think of this as a search problem, almost, where we start with a distribution over possible states. And then we get to take action, which will introduce a branching. Then we get an observation, which will introduce another branching. And if we run a filter through all that, at the end of those two steps, we'll have a new distribution over possible states. And if we look at this graph, we might want to try to optimize where we end up in that graph. So all of a sudden, we actually have a very feasible problem in the sense that it's clear. The formalism is clear. I just transition from distribution to distribution to distribution. It depends on actions and observations. Observations you don't really control. So you'll have to average, according to the correct probabilities, the outcomes that happen under a branch that's an observation branch. But then for the actions, you can maximize and choose the branch that's best. And so you get effectively an expected max problem. So it's just like an MDP. Um, but where now the state effectively is probability distribution. So I should fix this in my slide, but somehow it didn't propagate through. Um, but it's close enough to correct. So your policy is going to map from the interval 0, 1 to either listen, open left, open right. Um, what should the policy be? Um, well, roughly listen until sure and then open. What are the cutoffs? Well, if you only have one time step, this is all you have, then need to be 90% sure. So at um, essentially distribution 0 to 1, 0 0.1, you'll go 
in the direction you're confident. 0 0.9 to 1, you'll go in the direction you're confident. You'll have an expected reward above 0. And between that, you'll just listen. And you'll never exit the room. You'll only have one time. So it's better to incur the negative 1 guarantee than taking the risk of exiting with a tiger there. Then what you can do, and this really should be drawn with arrows going into that. But essentially, when there's two time steps uh, left, um, you, you can say, based on, I know the solution for only one time step left. From that, I can now infer, um, I can essentially backtrace in that graph and say, OK, um, what if I were to first uh, listen? which is pretty much the right thing to do when there's two time steps left, unless you're ext extremely, extremely certain. But um, it turns out that in this tiger environment, after you um, win or lose, you get reset into the room. So the way it was defined is that even when there's two time steps left, you probably prefer to listen first. Because um, either way, um, if you are very confident and you take an exit, you get dropped back into the thing with 0 0.5, 0 0.5, you only have to listen the next time. And so you'll incur a negative one of listening no matter what, even if you exited the first time, a little quirk in the thing. So you're guaranteed to always want to listen first. After you listen, which is always the right thing, depending on what you hear, you might end up in one of those three intervals shown above. And so that's kind of what the arrows that somehow got dropped um, should, would have shown is the kind of probabilistic transition from the different original intervals into, depending on what you hear, into the top intervals. And once you know which top interval you are, you know at the last time step whether to listen again or exit through one of the doors. So the canonical solution method for PalmDP is to just say it's a continuous state belief MDP. You can run value iteration on this. Essentially build a dynamics model. Your dynamics model is now when I take an action, I have a distribution, I take an action, I apply my dynamics model, which is the dynamics of data in the filter, then I'll have a distribution over possible observations. Because given my distribution over possible states, I can predict the probability of each of the possible observations. Say, OK, I know the probability of each possible observation. Now I have a branching, probabilistic branching for each observation that could happen, each of them resulting in a different posterior after the observation. So that is our full dynamics model, going from current distribution to a, um, essentially, distribution over possible future distributions, depending on which observation we got. So think of the distribution over x as just, um, you know, that's your state. That's your new state. Then essentially your state transitions from the current state to a set of possible future states. Um, if you solve this MDP, you'll get very interesting behavior. So you'll automatically do information gathering as needed. You'll say, I need to listen first before I take action. Um, or maybe the robot is in a dark room, the robot might say, oh, I should switch on the light so I can see something before I try to grab something. And so these are the kind of things that you hope to get out of a PalmDP. You hope to get from your solution something that says, I don't even have information yet. Here is the most informative thing I can do to maximize reward in the long run by collecting new information now. Now, the tricky thing is, even if you have only two possible states, let's say, tiger on the left, tiger on the right, you still have infinitely many belief states. Because any number between 0 and 1 is a belief state. So even for a state space with only two states, you have infinitely many possible beliefs. Which means that you right away are in the regime of exact value iteration not being practical at all. You'll need to use approximate methods. So you might use function approximation. Just like we saw for large state spaces, just this will be, even in the case of a small state space, will be a massive belief state space already. So what I just described is what it looks like. So let's step through this. Each, each belief node will have A action node successor. So you have a belief node, you have A actions available, A possible consequences or, or um, distributions available for the next time. Then each action node, once that's happened, there will be number of observations in the observation space, possible next things you could observe. And you'll have a branching on each possible observation. Then for each combination of action followed by possible observation, you can compute the resulting distribution. If I had taken this action, then how to observe this thing, this is the posterior I end up with. 
You can also associate probabilities with that transition. And this is really those equations. So if we have right now a belief vector B of S, we have a transition model and we have an observation model, we can predict the next belief by just applying our transition model to the belief. This is just saying my transition model under action A is just a matrix and I multiply with the vector that's the belief over possible states, I get the belief for the next time. Then I have an observation. With the observation, I reweight, as we know in observations, we reweight the belief, which is done by just um, this operation over here, up front, diagonal of observations um, times the belief, and then we renormalize. And we're good to go. So that's our new belief state. So very simple calculation. There's nothing complicated about this. It's just like what we've done in filtering. But the reason we're challenged is because the number, if you want to run value iteration on this, you effectively have to assign a value to every possible belief state. And there's just so many possible belief states that we can't tractably do this. What else can we do? Um, we can just do look ahead. So just essentially MPC, MPC in belief space. Because then we don't have to worry about infinitely many states. Well, right now we have a distribution. That distribution, if we have, let's say, um, an action available, if we have, um, let's say, two actions and two possible observations, then if we look two steps ahead, we'll have branching on action, which is two, observation two, and we'll have four possible next belief states. And so we go from one to four. We go another step in the future, we'll go to 16, to 64, and so forth. But over a limited horizon, we can actually look ahead. If there's not too many actions, not too many possible observations, we can do exact look ahead. If there's a lot of actions, a lot of possible observations, we could do sampling instead. We say we might do sampling of possible actions, sampling of possible observations, and approximately look ahead based on that. And so again, the key here is that because you always have a current belief state, when you do MPC-like belief space control, you don't have to start from infinitely many and finding values for them. You start from the one you're currently in, your current belief state, and branch from there. So that's actually medium practical to do. Um, what else can we do? Um, there is some highly specialized techniques, uh, alpha vector point based techniques, which essentially say that if you keep track of your belief state correctly and then you look at the value function, it'll actually take on a specific form. Your value function will be a, essentially a bunch of hyperplanes in belief space. So your value function will not be just anything in belief space, it's a bunch of hyperplanes. And so if you can treat, keep track of all the hyperplanes, then together you have the function. Now the number of hyperplanes you need to keep track of still explodes quickly, but in principle um, there is a clever trick you can apply um, that you can look up uh, if you want to with alpha vectors um, to still do value iteration maybe over a few time steps exactly, um, even if you can't do it over infinitely many time steps. Here's another thing you can do. You can um, plan in the MDP. So what does that mean? You're just going to ignore it's a POMDP. So you say, yeah, it's a POMDP, but you know what? I have a belief state, and mo my most likely state is, I don't know, some state. Let's just assume I'm in that state. I will have run for in the underlying MDP, which might be tractable, or I have a solution for the MDP. And I just take the optimal action under the assumption that the most likely state in my belief is actually the state. Is that a good strategy? Well, sometimes it is. If you don't have a whole lot of uncertainty, that can be pretty good. When will this completely fail? This will completely fail if the optimal strategy is to do explicit information gathering. Because you're essentially erasing the notion that you don't have state information. You're just saying, whatever is the most likely state, I'm assuming that's it. And so whenever you have a unimodal belief that's very concentrated, this might work pretty well. We have a very widely spread out belief, a lot of uncertainty, and you should be doing information gathering. This will never do that. OK, so mostly um, not so positive news so far, though you could run your kind of valid function approximation methods that we covered for state space and run it over belief space. Um, but actually, there is some good news. Just like in uh, valid iteration, where for continuous problems, uh, we could run LQR and optimization based control to still find solution in high dimensional spaces, we can do the same thing for POMDPs. Because we just said they're not any different. They are just belief state MDPs. 
And so we should be able to run the same optimization there. Some motivation for this originally, when this, this kind of line of work became very popular around 2010, 11, 12, was kind of some of these robots starting to pop up that are not super um, precise. And they might need to measure their state and have uncertainty about their state as they go along and maybe need to do information gathering uh, to succeed at certain problems. So some low-cost robot arms, some surgical robots that are not super precise due to cable stretch and other things. Now, imagine we're going to model our uncertainty as a Gaussian. So we have a start, and this is a particle filter running. But then we can say, OK, what if we fit it with Gaussians? And let's say maybe it's good enough. Then all we need to keep track of is a mean and a covariance. And so underlying a POMDP is really a filtering process. We know that. And so if we can assume when, let's say, an extended Kalman filter is good enough, then we can actually say the dynamics is the dynamics of an extended Kalman filter. It's an update to mean and covariance that will happen over time. Now that's pretty low dimensional. That's just mean and covariance. The belief state becomes a relatively small space that we can actually optimize over. So let's look at one of the popular examples. Imagine your robot starts in the top left. The goal is in the bottom left. If you have full state information, you would just move straight down and go to the target state. And that's the lowest cost thing to do because you get there the quickest. So state space plan, state space plan would look like this. But now let's say we don't know exactly where we are as a robot. There is uncertainty. And the circle shown around the start state is actually signaling the uncertainty, one standard deviation of uncertainty around that start state. Then if you move down, you'll end up with even more uncertainty by the time you think you arrive. And you might not at all be on the target. You might be in that bigger circle around the target. But now let's assume we have measurements available. Let's say something like GPS measurements, but the GPS doesn't really work when you're in the black area. It's dark, and it works well when you're in the bright area. Then what would you want to do? Then you'd want to move off to the right, get into the bright area, localize yourself very precisely. And once you've localized yourself very precisely, move back out to the target. And hopefully, as you move back out, the new uncertainty accumulated while you're moving out is relatively small. And you can get much closer to the target. So here's what a belief space plan would look like. And so now the question, of course, is how can you automatically get this plan? Instead of us designing the plan, can we get the thing to say, that is the thing you should do. Move into the bright area, then move back. Quick thing. This depends on the settings of the problem, right? Imagine as you move, you accumulate a massive amount of uncertainty. Then you might conclude that the shortest path is most important, because the, the further you move, the more uncertainty you accumulate. In this case, as you move, you see here, not a lot of uncertainty is accumulated. But initially, you have a lot of uncertainty. And you can go reduce that and then come to the target fairly precisely. So how do we get this belief space plan? Well, what does belief space look like? Our problem in this case would be to keep track of a mean and a covariance. So we have a Gaussian here. That's the representation of our current belief. There are many possible beliefs. Every choice of mean and covariance gives us a new possible belief. We can keep track of it over time with a Bayes filter. In this case, let's say an extended Kalman filter. So we can do planning through optimization. In state space, this is how we did it. In state space, we said minimize the cost over sequence of states and actions such that we satisfy the dynamics. And then we said, well, so W is noise. We said, let's do a deterministic approximation of that. And then we'll replan. We'll do MPC as we go along to compensate for the fact we didn't know the noise that was coming. Well, we can do the same thing for Gaussian belief space. So what does it look like? Now our cost is over means and covariances, because that's all we'll have available. We can't give it a cost over the actual state, because that would essentially require knowing the state. It doesn't really work. So cost is over means and covariances. And the dynamics is how the mean and covariance update over time through the extended common filter. But you think of the EKF just as an F dynamics. It's really the same thing. We have the same problem again, except instead of x being the variable, that's the thing we optimize as a sequence of things over time, it's going to be mu and sigma. Well, again, we don't know what we're going to observe. Zt plus 1 is an observation. It depends on the state, depends on the noise in the sensory measurement. 
we don't know what it's going to be. But we've dealt with that before. If we have something that's stochastic in this optimization, we replace it with the most likely thing. WT was zero mean Gaussian, so we replace it with zero. Here, we'll replace it with the most likely measurement. So if H is our measurement function, which has Gaussian noise around it, then we'll replace Z of T plus one with H of F of mu at time T and U time T. OK. So at this point, we have an optimization problem we can actually solve. It's not a simple one. I mean, the EKF has somewhat complicated matrix updates in it. But it is a clean optimization problem. We have a formulation. And we can just run gradient descent or something else to try to find the optimum. In these papers, this was solved with sequential convex programming. Um, Actually, the, the later papers by Jure Vandenberg also solved it with iterative <coughs> LQR. Iterative LQR is just a general method to optimize a sequence of states and controls. Well, just think of mu and sigma as your state. U is still your control. And so you can apply iterative LQR just as well to solve this problem. If you do that, if you run any optimization formulation, uh, any optimization uh, algorithm that actually optimized as well, so either sequential convex programming or iterative LQR, you'll end up with this plan automatically. So it'll infer on its own, I need to go collect data about where I am before I move out. <clears throat> now, one thing you might wonder is, um, how does this scale? And what is the best way to formulate this? Because we had one formulation here. But a very common scenario is that we want to when we think about state, it's not just the position of the robot. It's also the position of landmarks the robot is localizing itself against. So if we have a robot and landmarks, and it's trying to map out the position of the landmarks, which it doesn't know, and its own location, all of a sudden we have a very large state space. Coordinates of robot and coordinates of all landmarks. That's a slam problem. Now. When, it's, when the state space becomes larger and larger, that covariance matrix becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And you start wondering, well, will this still scale or not? How well will this work? So we did a study, and we looked at three different formulations. Remember, we have shooting and collocation methods. But here we can actually do a partial collocation. But let's first look at shooting and collocation. Shooting means we have a cost that depends on just essentially the mean at the initial time, the covariance at the initial time, and the controls. And then at the end, we need to be at the target. That's a constraint. Um, and we need to be feasible at every step. But the left thing here, is what we're looking at shooting, is essentially back variation through time approach. We don't have explicit variables for the means at different times. We just have the initial state and controls and optimize for the control sequence. Those are our only variables. In full collocation, we optimize over all variables, the means, the covariances, and of course, still the controls. And that's what we've seen before, where state was really mean and covariance, and now it's um, become mean and covariance. Now, the thing is, if we have all the covariance matrices at all times as our variables, the optimization problem becomes very big. And not very, actually, you'll see in the graphs, very intractable in practice, even though matrix calculus is only cubic in the size of, this, of the, the dimensionality of your space. Cubic is something that's already quadratic in your size of the space, because you're quadratic by building a covariance matrix. Then cubic in that, all of a sudden, things become very big and uh, too expensive. So partial collocation says we want to maintain the notion that we want to collocate on the means, because we know that by collocation, especially if we have a target state, we can have better initialization. We can force the thing to be shaped to find a solution more easily than shooting methods can. We have a more stable optimization because we don't need to backpropagate through time. We just, the means anchor this at every time step. And so the expectation is that with partial collocation, you get the stability of collocation, but not the blowing up amount of variables that you get from full collocation. <clears throat> so that's exactly what we get. So full collocation in red as a function of the number of landmarks in the space that we have uncertainty over blows up very quickly and becomes impractical. Most um, efficient is the partial collocation, um, far more efficient than either of the other alternatives, including also iterative LQR or LQG shown here. So 
here's an example. Here's the type of problem we looked at. Um, so a bunch of landmarks. Well, um, the the um, red crosses are the landmarks. The robot starts at the bottom left. And, and the goal for the robot is to find the path such that at the end of its trajectory, it's maximally reduced uncertainty about the locations of the landmarks. So initially, it doesn't know where they are. But by following a path and coming near them, and by keeping track of where, how much it has moved when it went from one landmark to the other one, it should be able to localize them all relative to each other and build a map of the environment where every landmark has a specific location and has low uncertainty. If you do a kind of standard thing, you just trace that um, rectangle. We're only showing the uncertainty on the robot here. But because the, ro the robot maintains a lot of uncertainty about the landmarks, it also has a lot of uncertainty about itself. Because the reason it's going to be able to localize itself is by reducing uncertainty on the landmarks. It's one big joint distribution. And so the uncertainty on the location of the robot gives you some kind of measure of how certain it is about where the landmarks are also. Well, what we wanted to do, I mean, the sensory model under the hood here is that the closer the robot is to a landmark, the more precisely it can measure its location. The further it's away, the less precisely it can measure it. It's far away, it cannot measure it at all. So if you're too far from any landmarks, you get no measurements at all. Here's what it then does. It says, after your unbelief space optimization, it follows this path that actually visits the landmarks very closely, has a lot less uncertainty about itself, as well as about the landmarks, even though that's not shown here. So the beauty here is that you get information gathering for free. Like it will be smart enough to go collect information as needed to maximize, in this case, um, the reliability of the map. Now, there are a few tricky things that come up in practice. So uh, the way I describe it is so that we just run optimization, and we'll get a nice solution out. And that was true for the original light dark domain. But what if this is the light dark domain, where you get good measurement here, but nothing here. So it's either nothing or a good measurement. Well, if you initialize with the certainty equivalent solution and then run your optimization, you set up your EKF, mu, sigma, full thing, partial collocation, all the good stuff, what do you think is going to happen? This is a local optimum. It's not going to move away from this, because if, if it moves towards the light, any motion towards the light will not give you a measurement yet. Any local motion will not give you any reduction in uncertainty. In fact, increase in uncertainty. Because by moving more, you generate more uncertainty. You have a longer path. And it's actually worse. So it's a pretty tough local optimum to get out of. In fact, it's, it's, it's a very good local optimal until, optimum until you realize there's something even much better if you were willing to move very far. So how to make that happen? Um, one thing could be just use a lot of random initializations and to say, well, maybe one of them will actually randomly be in the white region. And if it spends any time there, it'll realize to bend its path more to spend time there. Maybe you say, I'm just going to, um, I don't know, initialize it by hand to spend some time there. Um, but I mean, random, yeah, maybe you're lucky in a low dimensional space, it'll work out. Um, the more popular thing has been to shape. So just like in reinforcement learning, where you shape the reward to make your learning better conditioned, um, you can shape optimization problems of this type. So let's say I'm going to initially say that the measurements are actually available everywhere with different levels of noise. And I'll say, oh, I should move into the brighter region. Then I'm going to actually bring it slowly more, more closer to the original problem. So it's say. It's called a homotopy method, where you essentially take your original optimization problem, make it softer, make it better conditioned, and then gradually bring it back to the problem you really want to solve. And by doing so, the solutions you find for the simpler problems are hopefully good initializations for the harder problem you want to solve later. Here it is just about moving into the region where you can measure your location. Same thing happens with. Um, cameras and occlusions, though. Imagine you have a camera, and the yellow cone is the field of view. And you want to maybe see something, but there's an obstacle. The bottom plots have an obstacle. Now um, you cannot see what's behind the obstacle. The white region is invisible. And so if your robot is getting measurements from seeing things, if your view is blocked, you're not getting any measurements. That's the same challenge we had over here. You're either blocked and see nothing, or you're not blocked and you actually are able to see something and you get a measurement. 
So can we do the same thing here? Well, we cannot in execution see something that is actually not visible. If we're occluded, we're occluded. But we're thinking about the planning. Can we plan a path for the robot that accounts for the fact that you really should go look at it and reshape the optimization to get that to happen? We actually can. So the way to do it, we do, here it's a zero one thing, measurement or no measurement, depending on whether you are in the cone of the camera or not. Well, what if we make it different? We say that we soften this, and we do it based on the distance from the visible region. So right here, we have visible, the yellow part. If, something's, if the robot's set up such that something is almost, the camera's moved so it's almost seeing something, it's going to get a noisy measurement. If it can completely see it, less noisy. If it's very far away from the boundary, it's going to get a very noisy measurement. So you have a gradation of noise depending on how far away you are from being within the cone of what the camera can see. And I should do this in the common filter. So in the common filter update, you can make a small change. Normally, it's a binary variable, this variable um, delta that's appearing here in a common gain update here, here, here. Um, normally, that is going to be a binary variable 0, 1. When you have a measurement, it's 0. You get nothing out. We, uh, when it's, you don't have a measurement, it's 0. You get nothing. When you do have a measurement, it's 1, and you get a reduction in uncertainty. We can make this thing scale between 0 and 1, depending on the distance, the sign distance, to whether you are in the measurable region. By doing that, and doing that gradually, we can have a sequence of optimization problems where solving for the sequence of means and covariances and controls will be a much better shaped optimization problem than the original one. We will define solutions. So we solve the optimization problem with the current value of alpha, which will be a very smoothed out version. Then we increase alpha. We reintegrate the belief trajectory. Essentially, we run the current solution we found as our initialization, and then repeat. OK. so. Here's the full algorithm. Um, this is from, from the specific paper. Um, but a, I'm not going to step into the details here, but at a high level, we know what's happening here. And you actually get this kind of solution. You get it to find those paths, and then it'll know to move into the visible region and then move back out. But if that's all you do, and you just have a sequence of controls, here's what happens. Your thing, actually, due to noise, does not make it into the visible region. It's ready to turn around. It turns around, and now you still have a lot of uncertainty. So you need to do replanning as you run this, because the sequence of controls you found is not necessarily guaranteed to actually get you there. So you need to do continuous replanning, rerun this optimization. Then you need to do something else. If you are not in the region where you get to measure, you don't get a common filter update because you did not have a measurement. And so as you are progressing, some contradiction happens. You're progressing off to the right, and your mean is putting you in the measurable region, but you don't get a measurement because you're not actually there yet, and you don't get a measurement, you don't do a common filter update. And so you're kind of thinking you made it into the measurable region. You're all excited. You made it there. Your belief space plan will say, oh, it's time to turn around. It'll start turning around, and you actually shouldn't have turned around because you have not measured anything yet. Now, the reason that happens is because you're ignoring one type of measurement. The measurement you're ignoring is the fact that you're not getting a measurement. The fact that you're not getting a measurement is giving you information about that you are not yet in that region. So the question is, how to incorporate that? Well, imagine you think you're in the sensing region, which is the yellow region, but you're not. Um, and let's do this on 1D in the middle plot. What it really means is you thought you're in the yellow region somewhere, but you're actually not. So you should cut that off. You should take your Gaussian, cut off that entire tail that's in the yellow region, refit a new Gaussian that puts essentially all, not all because it's a Gaussian, but essentially all its mass into the region where you know you can be based on not having a measurement. And then you have the new Gaussian shown on the right. Once you do that, you know you're not yet out there. and so. If you ignore it, this is what you get. If you understand this, you know you're not yet in the measurement region. Your belief will tell you that, and you'll, as you replan, will keep moving out till finally get in the measurement region. And then you'll be able to localize yourself, move back. So it's a very subtle thing. It's a subtle thing that it's nice to use common filters. They usually have a good measurement model. 
but keep in mind that sometimes you need that extra thing, which is the notion that if you don't get a measurement, it tells you something about where you are. And that's not going to be a regular comma filter update. It's going to be one of those Gaussian truncation type updates rather than a regular comma filter update. Here are some plots showing that indeed this works better this way. We can do this with um, also robot arms. There's going to be robots that navigate the arm. The camera is at the bottom here. It's looking up. The arm is blocking the view of the camera. Can't see anything. So you've got a robot arm to move out of the way to see where the object is. The actual object is where the green uh, square is. The mean is where the yellow square is. If you just do a certain equivalent plan, that's not going to work. Because then you just move to the mean, and you think you're done, but you're actually not done. That's ignoring uncertainty. When you properly solve it in belief space, you'll realize I have uncertainty. I need to open up, get a measurement that narrows down the uncertainty. Then when I see the thing, I can move towards it and get it. Um, here's another one where, um, in this case, the camera can move. And so it'll, the optimization will both figure out how to move the camera and move the arm to make things visible. Again, on the the first panel is the initial state. Second panel is if you just ignore the fact that there is a belief, it's just you, you assume the mean is the real state, you'll just move to your mean, and you won't actually have the object. You'll never have seen it. If you work in belief space, the camera will move to see it. The robot arm will move to make sure it's not occluded, and then reach the right spot. And you do the same thing with um, SLAM. So the same things will happen there. You'll have the robot move towards landmarks making sure they become visible, and then localizing itself with higher certainty and so forth. And again, all of it just falls out of the belief space plan. You don't have to specify this by hand. So um, one important thing is collision <coughs> avoidance. Um, I'm going to mostly let you read this part yourself. But the notion is that if you have uncertainty, you need to be extra careful about collisions. Because if you don't know where you are, well, then you might need to use that uncertainty as an extra um, safety margin around you when you do your collision checking. And so you have a bubble around you against which you collision check instead of just against the mean. Um, it can be done in various ways. Um, the kind of cleanest way um, when you have a robot with joint uncertainty is to use sigma points, just like we saw. Well, Ignacy covered it with you, the unscented common filter looks at these sigma points to represent the uncertainty, to represent the Gaussian. You can do the same thing with the links of the robot. You can look at the sigma points for each of the joint angles, turn that through the kinematic chain of the robot into sigma points of each of the, joint, uh, of each of the links, and then you can have an uncertainty around where the links might be. And you can take the convex hull of those possible, the sigma points that you get for the links to get the uh, region that you're worried about that you might get in collision with. So I'll let you look at the details for that. Um, key, again, is that you do MPC in all of this. In belief space, it's even more important to do MPC than in regular um, control. Because the reason you do MPC is because of uncertainty. If something is not as expected, you can replan. But in belief space, you have so much uncertainty, your measurement is going to tell you things you didn't know anything about ahead of time. So you need to use that measurement to your benefit and replan as much as possible. Here's this in action for a um, four degree of freedom planar robot, avoiding if you just do kind of a simple path, this is what you do. But if you account for your uncertainty, you realize that this is the better path where you have to move away a little bit, go to the left where you get measurements about your uncertainty, move back out, and still keep things in a safe region. Um, probability of collision is much lower when you do it in belief space with replanning than if you um, just do it naively. Um, Mean distance from the target is um, better with replanning, much better with replanning than open loop belief, span, belief space plan execution. OK, in the last two minutes we have here before 12.30, I want to tell you about separation principle. Kind of a crazy thing. Um, if, you're if you actually have state observations, uh, well, if you have a linear dynamical system with state xt and observations that are some linear combination of the state plus noise zt, then effectively, if all you observe is z, you have a belief space problem. Because you'd never get to see x. It's belief space. You should do belief space planning on this thing. It turns out that belief space planning <coughs> will be equivalent 
you're just planning against assuming your mean estimate is the correct estimate of the state. It's a very special case. The only case I'm aware of where this is true is for linear dynamical systems with linear observation model, everything Gaussian. It will happen to coincide. Once your dynamics is nonlinear, this is not true anymore. And so when you have nonlinear dynamics, you'll have effectively extended Kalman filter or unsighted Kalman filter you run to belief space planning over that. It will not be certainty equivalent. But if the system is actually linear, it is certainly equivalent. And the reason is that if the system is actually linear, no matter what actions you take, if you work through the math, no matter what actions you take, the covariance matrix on your state will be the same. You cannot affect the covariance matrix on your state. And since you cannot affect the covariance matrix on your state, all of a sudden it's not a belief space problem because the covariance is going to evolve according to a fixed dynamics which you have no control over. And the covariance is exactly the thing that makes it a belief problem versus not in this case. And again, apparently it's not because you have no control over it. Of course, it's generally true. If you cannot affect the covariance, then um, it will not be relevant to do belief space planning. But in pretty much every other problem, your actions will affect the covariance matrix because your actions will affect the type of measurement you get. The type of measurement you get will affect your covariance. But in this linear dynamical system, you have no control over the type of measurement you get. It's always a ZT equals CXT plus VT. And so somehow the math simplifies. Covariance equations are open loop, not dependent on your actions. Hence, the problem is equivalent to uh, certainty equivalent, the certainty equivalent problem. So the optimal belief space execution for a problem like this is you run a Kalman filter and you do LQR. And so as you run your Kalman filter, then you apply LQR, the optimal linear feedback controller, onto the mean estimate of your state. And that's it, nothing more complicated needed. Um, don't let that distract you from the fact that that's really an exception, but I think it's a pretty important exception to, to be aware of. So we covered Pomni piece today. It's about sensory measurements being accessible to you, but not the exact state. Um, we saw exact methods can be uh, pretty hard to run. We saw locally optimal solutions, um, where you have mean and covariance in Gaussian belief space that you have a dynamics for. We can directly optimize for it. We can use homotopy methods for dealing with discontinuities in sensing domain. And we also use the truncation, the Gaussian truncation, to account for the fact we did not get a measurement, even though maybe we thought we should have gotten a measurement. We can use sigma health for collision avoidance. And then this little quirky thing at the end is separation principle that somehow, for linear systems, linear observation model, your controls don't affect the covariance. Hence, this whole thing becomes not important as the one exception. All right, see you next lecture.